This is Come to Daddy with Ruben K, the podcast about parents that takes a deep dive into the trauma of my celebrity guests. I've got my existential flippers and my mindfulness snorkel and the wetsuit of entitlement. Dive, dive, dive. I don't want to say I have daddy issues, but when they told me Father Christmas comes down the chimney, I douched. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> Welcome to Come to Daddy, hosted by me, drag icon and roadkill on the highway of gender, Ruben Kay. Come to Daddy is the podcast where we delve into the murky waters of parenting from the child's perspective. Only the child is a fully grown adult and to add salt to the wound, a comedian. And what would comedians be without their parents? Well, they wouldn't have half the material, that's for sure. And that's what we're here to investigate. Here at Come to Daddy, I'm asking the big questions. How have our parents steered us or failed to steer us in the right direction? What is the right direction? What is steering? And why am I in charge of a vehicle when the closest thing I've ever come to driving is chipping my teeth on the gear stick? Join me and my celebrity guests as we delve, dive, dip and drop into our damage, our dread and also our delight as we examine our parents, their influence on our lives, our relationships and most importantly, on our material. And joining me in this questionable endeavour, my guiding light, my north star or possibly the rose to my fret, the producer extraordinaire Amanda Sangorski. I have to start with an apology, don't I? <laughs> Why do you, what are we apologising for? Well, the, the, mur- the murderer thing. <laughs> the murderer thing. I'd like to apologise. It's too soon? To apologise for you, never. It's too late to apologise. That's a song lyric somewhere. Mm, but no, I, I, sorry, go on. Ruth. No, 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 I was just going to ask you how you are this week, Amanda. Because I know the minute I... Coming back on Come to Daddy this week is, yes, I got her again. Actually, that's not fair. I hope you've been well. I know the minute... Oh, my God, now you see, now there's a free mic. I have nothing to say. And who have we got in the studio today? So, today we are joined by the... um Comedian's comedian himself, Stuart Goldsmith. Stuart Goldsmith, come to Daddy. So can I say an interesting thing about Stuart and maybe no. something that... But we could <laughs> yes, learn from it. We could <laughs> learn from it. And I've made notes and everything. Yes. yes, what's an interesting thing about Stuart? So he's got this hugely successful podcast, which I imagine you and he will, will talk about in a minute. But he has followers that, that, that subscribe to the show and he calls them insiders. Now, I know we've toyed with the idea of what to call our people, your mm. people, mm. And we floated daddyettes, but I wondered whether we needed to rethink that and think of a different way to describe people who come oh, yeah. to us and stay with us. And I thought about something like... What are lifelong the, fans? You've got the, some ideas. Well, like the baby Rubens. Oh, yes. The baby Rubens. It sounds like a 50s doo-wop group, doesn't it? Whatever happened to baby Ruben? Oh, that's very good. I'm enjoying it. Or the K-mongers. Oh. <laughs> Can Ooh, I just say if you're not if that, you're listening and not watching this his face is saying he he's trying not to be rude. That but, it just sticks in the back of the throat like at the nasal it's like wasabi it just sits there doesn't it? The, the K-mongers. The drag babies. I I don't even like that one. Who's no, going to like that? No. No one's going to like that one. Children of the Horn. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know why. I, yeah, Alex Horn will sue me. Oh yeah, Children of the K. Children of the K. I don't think. I love how you wanted to apologize for a very solid Fred and Rose West joke and yet you haven't apologized for any of this. I just I think if you want to email us maybe and right. tell us I what you list. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, why don't we empower the people? And if you have an idea about what fans of the Come to Daddy podcast or myself could be called, no, and also Amanda, <laughs> oh God, uh, could be called, uh, send an email in. And what is our email? Come to Daddy podcast at gmail.com. It's the lust for life that drips out of every pore <laughs> that I find so delightful. You can email us with suggestions for names. You can also email us with stories. If you have um, egregious moments in your own parental history or if you're a parent with kids and you've made some blunders, send them on in. Should I say blunders? Should it it just be in stories or...? Or just some funny stuff. 
That sounds good. So let's get into it. My guest today is a linchpin of the British comedy scene, host of the legendary Comedians Comedian podcast since 2012. Technically the competition, we won't mention it. He has interviewed over 400 comics about their craft. So what he doesn't know about comedy isn't worth knowing. He describes comedy as a lifelong struggle, a Zen struggle to be your most honest, most funny self. And yet, he trained at circus school and cut his teeth as a street performer in Covent Garden before going on to become a hugely successful stand-up in his own right. Stuart Goldsmith, come to Daddy. What an introduction. <laughs> I loved every minute of that. And I, I'm, and I should just, for, I mean, I don't know how much context you want to do. I'm, I'm, because I've got a lot of experience hosting podcasts, I don't have a lot of experience of shutting up and listening. And I did really well to shut up and listen there. But here are the, I've got factors that I need to deal with before we start. Can we do that? Okay. Absolutely. So, I just warn you, I will also not be listening. 100%. Great. Great. So, okay. Br- I could fall into your eyes. We've just met. You are so handsome and your eyes are just unreal. And I'm sat here in this grey T-shirt having forgotten we were going to be videoed. Um, And just for the benefit of the listener, there is also a fabulous picture of you, which is like a a studio shot lit photo of you that's adorning the wall that is no less perfect than your actual living face that's right next to it. And you have a production team and a script and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm just thinking, I know I've recorded the bulk of my episodes in like the street or someone's car. It's <laughs> <laughs> like the, the lobby of a hotel looking furtively over our shoulders. So I feel like I'm in the upper echelons here. It's a Do you know very what? exciting You really here. have taken a step up when you come into the Come To Daddy <laughs> podcast. Yeah. We've got everything here. We're so well organized. We might be part of the problem. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. And yeah, we're that's quite fair. happy about it. Look, the fact of the matter is, I don't go anywhere without studio lighting and a I perfect see. representation. I see. Otherwise, people are going to look at me without it and realize it's Bridget Nielsen in a wig. Oh, very good, very good. Okay, gotcha. Understood. Oh, well, so welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming in slate grey and all. Yes, I love it. I'm going to refer to this as slate grey from now on. And when I... my wife mocks me for looking boring, I'm going to say, actually, Ruben says it's slate. Correct. It's a pharaoh and ball moment. <laughs> and that's what we're here for. All right. Now, uh, a little fact thing here. Oh, no, just I've just got to hear my notes. Stuart was born in 1977. He's 45, full stop. That feels like an indictment, doesn't it? <laughs> I would, I would have gone without the full stop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty old. I'm, I'm pretty old in comedy terms. You are. like, I've seen, I've, I've been you doing are. it long enough that I've seen sort of waves and waves now of like the, the people I think of as the new cool kids are also old. Yeah. You know, so well, it takes a long time to get anywhere in comedy because, like you would know, as you would know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. No, for and sure. And the new hot thing is often the thing that has been doing the new hot thing for yeah. years until yeah, the yeah, right yeah. person paid attention. Exactly. And you're so you're kind of in the ascendancy. I'm going to start doing my podcast at you in a minute. I will. I will yes. No, I'll come on so, to your podcast. For sure. And so, we can do our things on each other. We'll do all of that. We're yeah. going to do our things on each other I'd at love a later that. date. Now, first off, we have uh, a trial by fire, a journey through the Simper Glades, the gauntlet here at the Come to Daddy chat. And I call it the parental questionnaire. Quick fire answers only. Are you prepared? Uh, no, but I'm ready. Fantastic. Names and ages of parents. Uh, oh, um, Dave and Sue. Uh, ages, I don't think I can help you. I think my dad must be 75. Is, is that mad? Yeah, he must be about 75. My mum is in her early 70s. And where do they live? Uh, my mother lives in Leamington Spa. Me oh. neither. <laughs> and, uh, and my dad lives uh, in southern Spain. Oh, They are not together. Well, not unless your dad has a very long penis. <laughs> Sisters or brothers? Uh, I have one, one sister. Uh, she has a very long penis. And uh, <laughs> one, uh, one brother. I've not seen it. I would like her number. How much, as a percentage, do you blame your parents for the way you turned out? Oh, um... Not much. Oh, uh, as a, expressed as a percentage, kind of 10%, I would say. Oh. I don't really blame them. I don't hold, I don't begrudge them any of it. I'm quite accepting. Well, of... then how are you even a comedian? Well, I know. I think this is it. This is why I'm, this is why I'm a linchpin of the comedy circuit and not the kind of the powdery glitter on top of it. Why am I always the fulcrum and not the weight? <laughs> Here's a question. We're going back to the blame. As we do. But I'm going to flip it. What would you say, as a percentage, would you credit your parents for the way you turned out? Oh, nothing at all. No. Um, uh, um, <laughs> they were very... Uh, as a, uh, a percentage? 
Yeah, like 50, I guess. They yeah. were very supportive, very accepting, and I wanted desperately to be different and weird and strange, mm. and uh, they didn't stand in my way, and so there was not much to rebel against. But I want to know about kind of an upbringing where you're trying to rebel against, or but you don't have anything to rebel I against. I know, I was rebelling against the, the kind of the context rather than an individual. Like, okay. I wanted... I, I was rebelling against school because mm. I hated school, which mm. was a sort of uh, really... Reasonable brain place to be. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It was... I. I uh, went to a private school. I got a scholarship to a private school. As a, anyone who did get a scholarship has to point out, I, we weren't oh, we, incredibly wealthy. Yeah. I got a scholarship. Um, but I joined that school halfway through the kind of junior school. So it was a completely weird alien environment. Where I don't know what in, that means in terms of ages. Uh, I guess I was eight and I was joining a school. I, was, I left my school before it, my junior school before it had finished gotcha. and was transplanted into this mm. uh, new thing, which was wildly different and oppressive and... Just kind of a regime, really, and uniforms and sports I didn't understand. Oh, and, and did it reject the transplant? Uh, yeah, I would say both, both. Yeah, yeah. It's, it rejected Graft the transplant. Host. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I rejected myself, I think. I do, it, having grown up through that system and then, and then you know, there's one or two people I'm still in touch with, friends who, uh, who like, there's a guy who sat next to me in every class and he had a whale of a time, it turns out. So it must have just been me. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like, I remember it being this awful kind of mm. dream-crushing sort of machine, but uh, Duncan seemed fine with it. <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. I hope, you're, I hope you're happy wherever you are. <laughs> what were the jobs that your parents had? Uh, absolutely textbook. Uh, mm. Textbook, standard, uh, middle-class, Levington Spa-type jobs. Mm -hmm. My mum was a primary school teacher, right. stopped when she had three kids, obviously, and then went back to it. And sure. then Give my, that pelvis a break. My dad... <laughs> well, oh. she's ovulating sand. Oh. Three my, kids. <laughs> I know. Well, I, now I've got a bit of context as a yeah. parent myself. I'm like, oh, Jesus. Um, my dad was a civil engineer, and uh, he what specifically... What is civil engineer? I don't know. Does but he? What he specifically did was he designed where the cones go on motorways. And he would, uh, he would but be they're in the movable. Yes, but they have to be put in a special place. And there's often, if there is a thing, for example, something I know to be called a contraflow, which is when traffic changes to the opposite lane around some building works, you've got to be really careful where you put the cones. And he was careful where he put the cones. Isn't it wonderful to know that anything can be a job? <laughs> My earliest memory is being stuck in an upside down traffic cone. I just, we always had some in the garden. Haven't we all? Yeah. I just want to say this. I, my job, is putting on like eight kilos of lead-based cosmetics that will render me sterile. These yeah. eyelashes, high heels, yeah, with my yeah. balls like shoved up inside me. And I'm Have curious about <laughs> every day of my life. I just love a little, I love the nestling yeah. right under here. I confuse them between my glands. I never know if I'm coming down with something or properly tucked. Yes. Oh. But I just, I find it very funny that I am as confused about your dad's job, which is yeah. a standard job I guess. in the world, There's plenty of cones. as much as he might be about mine. I think that's a beautiful thing. Yes, I think he would be. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's fun to imagine his reaction to you. He's very he's a very cool guy. Um, like, and it's not that he is. I don't think it's about prejudice. I think it's about experience. Let's go. Oh, yeah. What? What? What is this? And what yeah. do you do? Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. He, and yeah, exactly, exactly that, because he'd want to not get it wrong. He'd right. be like, oh. And I want to do that about the civil engineer. I'm like, oh, you put cones on a road? That's Yes, that's great. Yes, that's, totally. I totally. support that Well, it completely. was. He was very, he was very uh, cone-themed. Uh, it was a cone, <laughs> traffic yep. cone-themed life. No, this is all we comedy led. gold. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. I, I've never managed to do anything with it, but I tell you what, <laughs> I do enjoy ringing the highways agency to tell them about debris on the road. <laughs> <laughs> that, that has really stuck with me. So mum and dad, so they don't, dad lives in Spain and mum lives still in Leamington Spa? Yes. Yes. And when yes, did... So he, well, what all, what happened, the key, the key elements are, my dad l fell in love with Spain. For reasons I won't go into, he had a very, very, very difficult life growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, he outlived all his male relatives mm -hmm. and decided that he wanted to go and live in Spain. This was complicated by the fact that my mother didn't really seem that fussed about Spain. And then in Spain in 1988, we were in a very serious car accident, all of us. No one died, but we all got smashed to bits. Right. And um, like I say, I say smashed, but no one died. No one lost any limbs. Sure. We had lots and lots of, uh, there was lots contusions? of... Contusions? Yes, there was one or two contusions. Um, and uh, there was almost certainly PTSD sprinkled above us because it was a it was a horrible thing, mm. um, and it, no one was offered therapy for it because we hadn't done all the no. great work that's been done since on no. PTSD. So that happened, and then my mum was like, 
I'm absolutely not going to Spain. This is, and this is stuff I've synthesized from half remembered conversations and a general understanding of it. Right. And then um, I guess, my, uh, let me see, I would have been 23 ish, I guess. And my dad announced that he was, uh, he was, him and my mum were separating and that he was going to go off and live in Spain. Oh. So, and then he did. And I think my brother and my sister have varying levels of anger and resentment based on that. And I have no anger or resentment based on that because I was like, you've had a hard old life mm. and uh, you've got to do what you've got to do. Is is the hardness of your dad's life or the difficulty of this and is that present in him now as a parent? No, he's a fantastic parent. That's and, amazing. And he, do you know what I love is he's an incredible grandparent. When we, he doesn't, Because he lives in Spain, he doesn't see my kids very much, but he really makes an effort, and the times he has seen them, he just has all this brilliant granddad gear. Great. He's like my boy. We took my little boy. Was, uh, we went out to Spain. My little boy was about two, and he sat in the bath, and my dad was like, I'm going to get in your bath and rolled up, like took his shoes off and rolled up his sleeves and sat on the edge of his bath with his feet in it. And my son was delighted. Now, let's also, how did you get into circus and comedy um, from Bristol? From Leming- Leamington. Leming- Leming- Leamington. Yeah, 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 born in Bristol, grew up in Leamington. Um, I, I don't actually know how far away those two things are. Oh, an hour, separate concepts. hour and 45 minutes on a weekend. That, is that, that feels like all of Britain. Yeah, if you well, the reason we lived in Leamington Spa is because you can get anywhere in two hours, and it's good if you put cones on the motorway to be able to get anywhere in two hours. Cones on the motorway. Yeah. So um, we, uh, I've completely forgotten the question. It's because you never listen to me. <laughs> this is why this relationship isn't working. Um, are either of your parents in any way comic, intentionally or unintentionally? Um, I, not really, not really. My um, mum my loved kind of like um, Radio 4 classic, like she used to really like, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. Right. So she adored Willie Rushton and I really enjoyed that with her. And my first exposure to comedy was, uh, to sketch comedy, was a, an old British show called Not the Nine O'Clock News, mm-hmm. which had Rowan Atkinson as Mel Smith, Griff Reese jones and Pamela, I'm going to say Stevenson. Um, the other one definitely didn't do it. Uh, other people. And... Um, and they, uh, so, so I kind of found some comedy tapes, like, you know, cassette tapes of sketch show, or the audio from sketch shows. And I remember, I remember finding it and going, this isn't like them. Why have they got this? <laughs> so it's, it's not that they were particularly um, comedy type people. Mm. And they never really understood me becoming a comedy type person. Right. And when I stopped being a street performer and became a stand up, I remember my dad was quite relieved. He told me he was quite relieved because now he could describe to people what I do. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But they, yeah. they were never they were never unsupportive. Yeah. But nor did they really kind of get it. They were very much not in the business. And um, and as a result, it was just sort of this weird thing I was doing. And probably that's part of what I wanted to I wanted to have my own thing. It was probably about feeling like centered because I knew about the weird stuff. Mm. And I was like, I feel like I've got a community there. Now one of the one of the traits my dad has that I love is that when he was doing the, um, when he run his business, the kind of, uh, the uh, highway management it's called, not coning, but all of that business, um, he is at home in a boardroom rolling out blueprints and having high level meetings and technical stuff as he is in the yard on his hands and knees trying to fix a van to take the cones out. Right. And he gets on with everyone. And I love that because, and I, I have, imbo- without consciously doing it, I've really embodied that in my life. I love that I've got a really swanky degree in a kind of um, uh, like devised theatre and, you know, it's like studied really weird, unusual things, but also know lots of sideshow people. I really like the kind of breadth of experience of that. And so that's something that I... And so between his practical nature and kind of being able to apply himself to all sorts of problems, that's quite a... They didn't have the word then, and I hate the word now, but it's a sort of solopreneur thing. He has a kind of entrepreneurial spirit, mm. started his own business and what have you. And my mum is constantly having a crisis about everything. So <laughs> that's the sort of lineage of me. No, I see both of like those a, in you right huge, now. Have a huge constant <laughs> crisis. Think of brilliant, nine brilliant ways to solve it. Have another crisis. Think of brilliant you ways know, to solve that. My mum, as she's gotten older, has just gotten more anxious. Yeah. Just severely more anxious. To the point where I, at one point she turned to me once and said, um, oh, I just look back on my life and see all these um, missed opportunities or failures. And I'm like, that is not the mum that I know because I know my mum is this amazing trailblazing woman in her career and this firebrand yeah. incredible parent and this great wit and this very funny person um has mum come and seen stuff 
Oh, she uh, she didn't for years. She didn't right. for years. My Edinburgh debut was in 2010, and it contained material about. I'm I'm, was... I'm I'm pouring a jug, not paying for our listeners. There was some stuff in it about going to fetish clubs. My mum heard about it when a friend of hers clipped out a review from the Times Culture section and said, have you seen what uh, Stuart's up to? And she had a bit of a panic about it. And um, is is very... Like, because she was a teacher and because she was part of an, org- an institution and also because she is like she is, I think she felt that there was something about me that was a liability, something about me talking on stage that was a liability. She basically felt that if she came to see me do stand-up, it would upset her Mm. on some level. And she probably hadn't kind of voiced that to herself or thought about it until I kind of said, hey, you know, many years into my comedy career, I was like, I just, I feel like I've written a book and you haven't read it. Can you come and see me? Can you just come and see the show? And she did and she made a big... She was very worried about it and stuff, and it was just fine because it's just me doing stand up. And she was like, "Oh, I'm quite, I quite like it, quite proud now, you know," which is <laughs> which is lovely. She loves me to bits. I love her. She's yeah. fab, but she just like she is. She is sort of set at, mm. oh shit, this is <laughs> oh god, like that. Do you know what I mean? Like we're, we're we're always one minute away from everything being a bloody mess. Yes. As as women get older, there seems to be like much more anxiety f- drip feeds in. As well, yeah, do you think it's accelerated as she ages? I don't know. Or has it always been quite? It's constant? always been quite <laughs> full on. Yeah, you know, she's. I think. Um, I think it's always been there. Wow. Um, and I think that. Yeah, I mean, as people get older, the spectre of death hovers ever nearer, doesn't it? And and. Sh- you know, when you hear your parents start to say things like, "Well, I'm not going to be around forever," you know, and you go, "You're sure." Do oh. we need, like, how accepting of this are we? Can't wait. I feel that. Can't wait. <laughs> my mum's. No, for can't them wait to go. Dies. My mum has already said, first time I pee myself in public, it's a brick to the back of the head. My dad has exactly the same. Exactly so I just, the same. I just test all the time. I shout boo behind her and see how <laughs> we're going. My, my dad, because he, he lived with my uh, grandmother, his mum, for a while, as she gradually became, she had Alzheimer's, it got worse and worse, and uh, she lived for a very long time and then fell apart over quite a long time. Mm. His whole angle to that is, switch me off. If yep. I ever get like that, switch me off. And I'm like, she was not plugged in to the living, <laughs> you know. But I'm pretty sure he will have a Dignitas pill in the fridge on the lower shelf so if he falls over, he can reach it still. I'm sure he's thought about it. You describe yourself as a therapy junkie. My podcast is uh, has been described variously as a uh, an untrained man attempting psychotherapy with no regard for the consequence. I'm sorry, that's what most therapy is. My, yes. When I was going through some stuff here, I was seeing a therapist. At one point, she took the therapy ma- manual, like one of the therapy textbook, and left the room and came back with a photocopy of the chapter on grief and how to deal with it and said, pass it to me and went, have a read of that. I'm like, no, you're meant to read it. This is the instructions. Yeah, (laughs) You're meant to read it and implement it to work with me. Ah. So you think at the end of the chapter it says, if you can't be bothered with this one, just photocopy this and hand it over. (laughs) Correct. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what it said. I don't know. Look, she also lived on a houseboat and I refuse to be told I've got daddy issues by someone with a chemical toilet. Fair, fair. So... As your family as sort of into therapy? Not at all. No. no. I, don't, um, I think my Are they mom, suspicious of it? I think, uh, I don't know. So because of the, uh, the aforementioned unmentioned business in my dad's mm. life, he has got a lot of childhood and adulthood trauma, mm. which he will admit, and I don't think he'd mind me saying, he has got locked away in a little box in the back of his mind, doesn't confront it, and gets on with his life. And it works for him. It's sure. super functional. When I first got into therapy, I became a very evangelical about it. It was the every the conversation. Worst. Dad, you know, mate, you should get some therapy. Hey, uh, my brother, you should uh, you get some uh, therapy, mate. Um, I got very, very kind of, uh, yeah, like that about it. And my dad made the point that um, he, even back then, he was like, I'm getting on a bit. And I'm pretty sure it's almost like he never, he never articulated this. But it's almost like, oh, my plan is I'll just die. You know, so that and that's a plan that works, right? It really so does. So he doesn't need to confront that kind of stuff. No, my mum, I think, sees a sort of nice, nice middle class ladies counsellor, right. but I don't know how kind of vigorous the therapy is. I have a friend who, right as we speak, probably is going through this big unpicking. She's a she's a big sort of social and personal development course type junkie, and she's going through some stuff with her family where they're all on board together working through some stuff. And I am sort of in awe of that 
but I have mentioned it and brought up the possibility of it. And our family is very much like, no, no, we're fine. Or not, not even, no, no, we're fine, but just like, that's not for us. Yeah. So, so the nearest we've got to that is basically me taking acid and then the next day ringing everyone and just individually telling them the breadth and depth of my love for them. So it's which, which, like the opposite of an intervention. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're taking yeah, yeah. drugs and then you're telling a multitude of other people. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, the, the, the effect that that has, I think, or, or rather their response to it is like, well, this is a classic Stu thing to do. We don't need to engage all that much That's with it so but i tell you what as a kind of positive intervention you've just re- made me remember my daughter my four-year-old she invented this thing last year she just invented it she snuck up to mummy and just whispered in her ear you're amazing you're amazing you're amazing you're amazing and now we all do it to each other as family members she just did it for no reason that we could perceive and it was just like oh yeah that's a lovely thing that's isn't it? so lovely so now we do it to each other it's super healthy and and lovely that's touched me that's oh, really right. gorgeous yeah. i'm going to implement that it's so nice especially if you can get a 4 year old to do it little 4 year old whispering in your ear i'll find someone can definitely you pay a 4 mine. year old yeah, to tell yeah yeah come to bristol just we'll whisper get... in my ear you're amazing you're amazing mate because you just know that children don't have like the guile yet yes they don't have the goal oriented insincerity yes, it... well actually well, yes. If they, I don't think they were doing my, it in order to get sweets. But. My niece is a negotiator. Yeah. So anytime there's like, okay, we're playing this game. This is the last round of this game. No, two rounds and a story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And where did that come? You just raised the stakes yes. so high just so you know you, when you come down, yeah. you're going to... Yeah, then naturally, na- you have to think of them like little scientists. What happens if I do that? What about yeah. that? What can I get for that? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's but yes, you are very that. welcome and would fit in around our house. So anytime you want to come and have my children I'm affirm f- you, that's on the table. I would love that because Lord knows if there's one thing I need, it's more approval. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time for you, our esteemed guest, to take a break from the conversation and delve your hand into the Come to Daddy pick and mix. This is where you get to choose a story to share about your parents. Please use the gloves and tongs provided. Yes, the Come to Daddy pick and mix. It's like Russian roulette, but with trauma. Enjoy. Daddy, Daddy, look, I'm doing a dive. Can you think? <laughs> Isn't it great? It's so, that's my memory of my entire childhood. Is me being like, look, look. Oh, and my yeah. mum being like, sorry, I've just got to go win an award. Bye. Ah. Um, can you think of a way you tried to get your parents' attention? Well, it's a funny one, this, because I can think of I can think of ways in which I rebelled, but I don't know that I was trying to get their attention. Like I, I remember I don't know how old you are, and it's impossible to guess. Correct but, answer. But um, uh, I remember Pump Up the Volume, the Christian Slater movie. I was very, very partial to a bit of Christian Slater. And um, True romance. Who wasn't? Oh, yeah, for sure. That was, that was kind of post my childhood. But I remember having a, a Christian Slater poster from like Smash Hits or something and uh, Paula Abdul. And I was like, there we go. The two pillars of my sexuality. These guys, <laughs> really great guys. Um, and uh, so... He was in Pump Up the Volume, which was a kind of, he was like a radio DJ, like a talk radio guy. And it was like the whole thing was so be it. And the, you know, his catchphrase and the realization, the revelation of the movie, it was all about acceptance. And it was like, you know, adolescence is shit and the the goal is to get through it. And I think I was going through a sort of self-inflicted maelstrom of adolescent Mm. torment. And um, and I spray painted so be it in black spray paint on our magnolia chip, you know, <laughs> wallpaper, and they didn't mind at all. And but that's the funny thing is like I wasn't doing it to get their attention. I was like that would look cool there, and I'm sure no one would mind. And they were like, mm. you know, and there was that. So I was that's like, very Great. funny. Phase two. So then I got the entire wall, which must have been I don't know, like twelve foot by twelve foot. Um, wall of my bedroom and spray painted the uh, the cover of Pretty Hate Machine, the Nine Inch Nails mm. album. It's like, ugh, like great big slidey oh, kind of thing Im- like that. Imagine the fumes in your bedroom. It was quite fumey for sure. Yeah, um, I think that's maybe where you started to think about every, becoming a psychonaut. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I can make the guys will be fine with you. Um, yeah, so uh, so I did that again. But again, it's not like I don't think that. I mean, I probably asked for permission. Or I just knew that they'd be like, oh, well, you know, that'll paint over. I love that you asked for permission to rebel. Well, I... That's cute. That's very adorable. Yes, but that's the thing. I don't know whether it was an attempt to rebel so much as an example of me kind of going, oh, outward creativity and difference. And my parents kind of going, yeah, sure. 
Same for me, but it was a shrine of Bette Midler. Okay, yeah. On right. my wall, like the got an entire wall was this very symmetrical, like kaleidoscopic shrine of Bette Midler, and my mum just looking at it. Just going, okay. Mm. You was that you coming out? Mm. Did she know by then? Oh no, that was like maybe five years before. No, no, that, I think that was you coming out. <laughs> no, 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 I was very mask. Oh, was... okay, fine. <laughs> sh- you think they looked through the shrine of Bette Midler and went, well, no, no, business as usual. I had hung up my fencing medal next to it. Oh, wow. Look at that. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Epe? True. <laughs> C. We. Oui. Very nice. Yeah, Epe, gold medal, under 12s. Oh, yes. No, under 13s, Victorian Royal Institute. But you were an adult and you just killed loads of under 12s. I did. Great. Yeah, great. Well, actually, I was um, I was quite a long child. I've you know, always this, been like. This kiss curl is very fencing. Oh, away. absolutely. Yeah, like you take the mask off. And... <laughs> yes. But I was always a very long child. So you put a sword in this kind of tentacle oh, of course, that I have. Oh, course, the John Jones. Yeah, sure. And there's honestly one of the matches, because under 12 was like under 13 was like the, the younger stage limit. So sometimes I'd be going up against like an eight year old oh. who would just like put the adult fencing mask on and the God. adult fencing like padding and then have this adult sword that he couldn't lift and he'd just like run at me and all I'd have to do is just like, Bonk. oh dear. It was very funny. You just stand there and they just marshmallow themselves yeah. on your thing one Correct. after another. And, and then we metal. made toddler s'mores. Yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful. Now, here we go. This is the final. This is the final journey, a baptism by fire indeed. Uh, And we call it Shall I Be Mother? Shall I Be Mother? And that is where you, the guest, have come to daddy. You get to stare into my beautiful and natural eyes. Don't look at the forehead. It's medical grade veal. Mm -hmm. And imagine that I am one, either, or both of your parents and speak truly from the heart. What would you say to them? Well, I thought I thought a little about which parent to imagine because the thing is, I don't know that there is stuff unsaid with either of my parents. So I don't know. I will probably cry because I'm a crier and you have wonderful eyes in which to get lost and cry. But um, I think I've said everything I need to say to both of them. So if I were to say to my mother, if I imagine that you, Reuben, are my, are my mummy, Mm-hmm. And I say, I love you. You're really wonderful. I wish you'd give yourself more of a break. You know, you deserve a break. You've you've brought up three kids. You've um, you are a, a really wonderful person. And I wish that you could learn to sort of dial down the pressure you put on yourself and the fear that you have about the world, and that you could just take a breath and just be a bit kinder to yourself because you deserve it. But that's going to make you cry now. Well, it will. It absolutely (laughs) will. Because I forgot you were talking to your mother. And I felt it was about me. Oh, yeah. This advice you can just stick on anyone. (laughs) This is fantastic. Well, that was a lovely and lovely hour to spend with you, Stuart. Oh, great to spend time with you. It's a joy. Now, where can people, listeners of Come to Daddy, find you? Uh, if everyone would care to go to stuartgoldsmith.com, I finally bought the dot com, the dot com for, for 500 quid off an absolute chancer. Stop it, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, and his Stuart Goldsmith wasn't even his real name. It was his kind of stage name for his... Um, uh, his kind of sideshow and comedy and juggling no, career. No, no, his his thing was like the Midas touch steps to wealth. So he'd put, oh. he'd called himself Goldsmith oh. after that thing. But look, nice enough guy. Sure. Called me, called me my boy. Like in in text, like in a couple of emails, I was like, I don't know that I'm responding well. To M apostrophe boy. boy. M apostrophe boy. Who does that? Mm, this guy. <laughs> uh, but not Stuart Goldsmith. Certainly not the real one. So go to stuartgoldsmith.com and you can see a little trailer there, if I'm permitted a plug, mm. for a special that I have coming out uh, in at the end of this month, the 23rd of February. And it is a worldwide digital premiere. Oh, well done. Which is very hard to explain to people what that is. But basically, it's a pre-recorded show that they live stream and we all watch at the same time. Oh, that's And if nice. you get the right kind of ticket, you can have like a live Q&A after party thing with me afterwards. Oh, I love that. And it's super fun. I'm so proud of the show. It's the first time I've had a show that wasn't DIY self-produced. Produced. It was some people have invested in it, and they had a ton of camera people and makeup people and runners, and it was all the proper shit. Feeling fancy, and coming for my gig. Yeah, man. Oh, it was so, it was just lovely. It was lovely to do, and I'm thrilled about it, and I want everyone to know about What's it. What's so, the date one more time? Uh, 23rd of February. And they can go to stuartgoldsmith.com? Stuartgoldsmith.com. There's a little banner trailer thing there that you can very, uh, it will appear magically at the top of your 
homepage. Heaven and on a stick, and if they wanted to see you live? Um, that would also contain a variety of my live dates and links therein. Um, mm-hmm. Most of my socials are either Stuart Goldsmith Comedy or at ComComPod on Twitter, which is the Comedian's Comedian podcast. Which is also, by the way, ridiculously successful. Have a listen. It's fantastic. Get on it. It's niche but timeless. <laughs> Stuart Goldsmith, thank you for coming to Daddy. Thanks, Daddy. Mm-hmm.